What's gaming gamers? Today, I've got a build for you using the Sunbreaker Titan subclass paired with the exotic leg armor Phoenix Cradle. This build works in any content you want, whether you're grinding seasonal activities, running nightfalls, or working on solo flawless in a dungeon. Phoenix Cradle works very similarly to the Lorelei Splendor Helm exotic helmet, but Phoenix Cradle is much less selfish than Lorelei Splendor and will work to make both you and your teammates near invincible. To explain how that's done, I'll first describe what Phoenix Cradle and its exotic perk, Beacons of Empowerment, do. Beacons of Empowerment will double the duration of Soul Invictus, granting you the buff for 10 seconds instead of 5 when you walk into a Sunspot. Additionally, Beacons of Empowerment allow Sunspots to affect allies and will grant them Soul Invictus for 10 seconds when they walk into a Sunspot as well. This does require you to have the Soul Invictus aspect equipped, but so long as you do, Beacons of Empowerment will grant these buffs. Now that you're aware of what Phoenix Cradle does, I'll go into the subclass setup for this build. I'll put everything on screen first as a prescriptive setup if that's what you prefer, and then I'll go into detail about what each subclass element does, as well as any alternative options should there be any. To start, run the Hammer of Soul Super. Run the Rally Barricade, whichever jump you prefer, the Hammer Throw Melee, the Healing Grenade, the Roaring Flames Aspect, the Soul Invictus Aspect, Ember of Mercy, Ember of Searing, Ember of Solace, and Ember of Torches. Now, to detail the subclass, I'll start with the supers. Hammer of Soul is the super I use, as it's both a ranged super, meaning it's safer to use in higher difficulty content, as well as being able to summon sunspots, which will synergize with Phoenix Cradle. Upon the casting of Hammer of Soul, so long as you're on the ground at the time of casting, a sunspot will form at your feet. Sunspots will also form at the location of impacts of Hammer of Soul, meaning you can cast your super and throw a hammer at a teammate to grant them the buffs provided by the sunspot. The Burning Maul super is a melee super with a somewhat ranged heavy attack that will track to enemies along the ground and damage them. I'm not actually sure if Burning Maul does more damage than Hammer of Soul, but I do know that in late to end game content, the damage resistance provided by melee supers just isn't sufficient to keep you alive against most enemies you'd be using a super on. For that reason, and the fact that Hammer of Soul can summon sunspots, I use Hammer of Soul. Onto the Barricade, personally, I use the Rally Barricade. Rally Barricade, while standing behind it, will grant you 100 points to your weapon's reload stat, 30 to its stability stat, an increase to its damage falloff range by 10%, and 50% flinch resistance. This makes it a useful tool when dealing with enemies such as champions or bosses from range, as all of those boosts will increase your overall DPS on any given target. Pretty much the only downside to the Rally Barricade is the minimal cover it provides, as its cooldown is also shorter than that of the Towering Barricade, with the Rally Barricade's cooldown being 38 seconds, which is 10 seconds shorter than the Towering Barricade's base cooldown of 48 seconds. The Towering Barricade will provide a significant amount of cover to you, which can help you reinforce a position if you're in need of that. This can be helpful in specific encounters, for example, the majority of the Glassway Nightfall Strike, but I find Rally Barricade's boosts to weapon proficiency more valuable than Towering Barricade's cover providing capabilities. I recommend thinking about the encounters you'll face in the activity you'll be entering and deciding whether the Rally or Towering Barricade would be better for you in said activity, as both of them are useful in their own ways. As for the melee ability, the Throwing Hammer melee will be the best option. Throwing Hammer is an effectively spammable melee ability, as you can pick it up after you've thrown it, so long as you've not thrown it into an inaccessible area. Throwing Hammer is also beneficial to this build's survivability, as picking up the Throwing Hammer after it's struck a target will grant you the Cure buff, which simply instantly heals you for 60 health. You can grant yourself this Cure buff as many times as you want, with the only cooldown between activations being the time it takes for you to throw another hammer. One thing that is incredibly helpful for the Throwing Hammer melee is your Keybinds. If you're unaware, you can change your melee keybinds to be different buttons for your powered and unpowered melees. This lets you both use your powered melee when within close proximity to enemies, as well as use your unpowered melee while your powered melee is fully charged. I have my powered melee set to a mouse button, and I have my unpowered melee set to the C button on my keyboard. Alternatively, you can set the separate keybinds of powered melee and unpowered melee in the settings to the same button. This will achieve a similar result to having separate keybinds. It will always prioritize your powered melee if it's fully charged, no matter your proximity to enemies. This won't allow you to use your unpowered melee if you'd like to while your powered melee is fully charged, but admittedly that isn't something I find myself needing to do very often. All of this keybind changing can be done in the settings menu, either in the keyboard and mouse section if you're using a keyboard and mouse, or under the button layout menu in the controller section if you're using a controller. Onto the grenade, really you can use whichever one you want. I usually use the Healing Grenade, as I enjoy its burst of both instant healing and restoration, but it's a bit overkill to be running the Healing Grenade with this build, as it gets a significant amount of healing from other sources and doesn't really need the Healing Grenade outside of very niche, unlikely situations. In higher-end content, I find the Healing Grenade to be invaluable, as enemies hit significantly harder and an instant burst of cure is very helpful for keeping yourself alive if you found yourself out of position, but for most content, you can run any of the damaging grenades. Now, I'll get into the aspects. Firstly, Roaring Flames. Roaring Flames will grant you an escalating increase to your solar ability damage upon getting kills with either solar abilities or ignitions, and stacks up to 3 times. Roaring Flames lasts for 20 seconds and is refreshed to that duration every time you get a kill with a solar ability or ignition. All stacks do disappear simultaneously, but that's less of an issue as you get to the maximum 3 stacks, as the increase to damage is significant. As for that increase, at 1 stack of Roaring Flames, your solar abilities will deal 20% more damage. 
At two stacks of Roaring Flames, they'll deal 44% more damage, and at the maximum of three stacks of Roaring Flames, they'll deal 73% more damage than normal. The abilities that have their damage increased by Roaring Flames are both of the supers, all of the damaging grenades, and both of the melee abilities. Furthermore, while you have any stacks of Roaring Flames, your unpowered melee will count as powered melee hits and kills for the sake of fragments and armor mods and will apply 30 Scorch to enemies hit. For the second aspect, Soul Invictus is a must pick for this build. Soul Invictus will create sunspots at the locations of enemies killed by solar abilities, enemies who die while scorched, and impacts from the Hammer of Soul Super. Every sunspot created by any source will grant you and any allies who pass through them restoration times 1, a 20 to 40% decrease to your roaming super's passive energy drains while active, and a 100% increase to both grenade and melee ability energy regeneration rates for 10 seconds with the Phoenix Cradle legs. Lastly, sunspots do deal damage to enemies, as well as applying 5 scorch to any enemy standing inside one every 0.16 seconds. Onto the fragments, firstly, Ember of Mercy. Ember of Mercy will grant you and nearby allies restoration times 1 for 5 seconds upon reviving a teammate, which can be invaluable when you need to revive a teammate who's died in a bad position. Furthermore, upon the collection of a Fire Sprite, in addition to the 12.5% grenade energy granted by the Fire Sprite itself, you will be granted restoration times 1 for 2 seconds. With this build, you'll likely never even notice this part of the fragment, but it's a nice backup just in case you find yourself without restoration, but with a Fire Sprite on the ground. Lastly, Ember of Mercy increases your resilience stat by 10 points, letting you focus more into other stats of your choosing. The next fragment is Ember of Searing. Ember of Searing will grant you melee energy and summon a Fire Sprite upon killing an enemy who is Scorched. This build will be scorching enemies constantly with sunspots, so Ember of Searing will proc constantly. Admittedly, the melee energy part of this fragment isn't entirely necessary, but it's a good boost if you find yourself without your throwing hammer. Fire Sprites have a 5 second cooldown on summons, meaning you can only spawn one every 5 seconds. But, as this build will scorch effectively every enemy, you'll be summoning Fire Sprites on cooldown, which upon collection will grant you grenade energy, as well as restoration granted by the Ember of Mercy fragment. The third fragment is Ember of Solace. Ember of Solace will increase all Radiant and Restoration effect durations by 50%, which synergizes heavily with this build. As Sunspots give you restoration for 10 seconds due to the Phoenix Cradle legs, Ember of Solace increases it to the maximum duration of 12 seconds every time you step in a Sunspot. This makes it significantly easier to keep the buffs active, allowing you more freedom to pick your targets carefully in higher-end content or simply carry the buffs between encounters. Ember of Solace also affects the next fragment, Ember of Torches. Ember of Torches will make you radiant for 8 seconds upon dealing damage with a powered melee attack, and with Ember of Solace, that duration is increased to the maximum of 12 seconds. This has the same benefits as the increased restoration duration. Those benefits are that you can choose your targets more carefully, and don't have to stress as much about keeping your buffs active when in an encounter. Ember of Torches does lower your discipline stat by 10 points, so keep that in mind when putting together your armor build. With the subclass build now done, I'll get into the seasonal artifact if you're playing during Season 20, the Season of Defiance. On screen, you're seeing the artifact setup I use when running this build, and I'll highlight a couple of important mods now. In the first column, run whichever anti-champion mods you need for the activity you'll be entering. The Radiant buff will grant any weapon that doesn't already have an anti-champion mod anti-barrier rounds, which means you could theoretically get away with not choosing an anti-barrier mod, but I like to have one just in case I can't proc Radiant for myself. In the second column, run the authorized mods for solar weapons and grenades. These mods will lower the cost of armor mods that affect your solar weapons or grenades to a cost of 1 energy, which will allow you to slot more mods into your armor. In the third column, firstly, run the Shatter Orbs mod. Shatter Orbs will summon an Orb of Power upon the destruction of a combatant shield with the corresponding energy type. Importantly, this only works the first time you destroy any one combatant's shield, which prevents you from farming one specific enemy for effectively infinite orbs. Next, in the third column, run the Solar Surge mod. Solar Surge will grant you an Armor Charge upon the collection of a Fire Sprite, which increases both the utility of your Fire Sprites as well as your Armor Charge uptime. In the fourth column, if you plan to run this build with the Firebolt Grenades, run the Flare Up mod. Flare Up will cause your Firebolt Grenades to apply significantly more Scorch Stacks, which means the Firebolt Grenade will apply 50 Scorch Stacks to an enemy instead of its base 20 Scorch Stacks. Additionally, Flare Up will cause a Fire Sprite to be summoned nearby the location of any one enemy damaged by the Firebolt Grenade, suggesting the Fire Sprite is off its 5 second cooldown. In the 5th column, continuing from the Flare Up mod, run the Reign of Fire mod. This mod will simply grant you a second Firebolt Grenade, effectively doubling your damage output. Lastly, for Artifact mods, run the Prismatic Transfer mod. Prismatic Transfer will grant your allies a 20% boost to outgoing weapon damage upon the casting of your super, so long as their subclass element differs from yours. The damage boost granted by Prismatic Transfer doesn't stack with other damage boosts, like Radiant or Weapons of Light, but if neither of those boosts are active, Prismatic Transfer is a good passive buff to your teammate's damage output. With the artifact now done, I'll get into the armor setup for this build. I'll start first with stat distribution. In the top 3 stat grouping of Mobility, Resilience, and Recovery, spec into Resilience first, with Recovery being a secondary stat. Mobility can be ignored, as it's not generally a beneficial stat for Titans outside of very specific circumstances. Resilience will always be a good stat, however. On top of being the Titan class stat, meaning it affects the cooldown of your barricade positively the higher tier resilience you have, it also grants you an additive 3% damage resistance to all incoming damage per tier up to a maximum of 30% damage resistance at tier 10. 
Recovery is also a really good stat, as it affects the delay before starting both your health and shield regeneration after having taken damage, as well as the rate at which you regenerate both your health and shields. However, with this build specifically, you'll have restoration near 100% of the time, which means recovery isn't as important a stat as it can be on other builds. Mobility simply affects your movement speed and jump height, neither of which are requirements for this build to function. In the bottom three stat grouping of Discipline, Intellect, and Strength, spec into Discipline first, with Strength as a secondary stat, and try to keep your Intellect at at least 30 points. Discipline is an important stat, as the higher your Discipline, the faster your grenade will recharge. Strength does the same for your melee ability, but is less important than Discipline because of the ability to pick up your throwing hammer after having thrown it. Intellect is a stat you want to have at least 30 points in, as anything less than that lowers your super regeneration rate and the amount of super energy gained by killing enemies. The amount of super energy gained by killing enemies caps out at tier 5, so avoid anything above that, but so long as your intellect is between tier 3 and tier 5, you'll get your super back very quickly. My armor stats have me at 31 mobility, 100 resilience, 61 recovery, 91 discipline, 41 intellect, and 63 strength. With stat distribution done, I'll get into the armor mod setup for this build. I'll first put everything on screen as a prescriptive setup, if that's what you prefer, and once I've done that, I'll describe what each mod does as well as detail why I've chosen it. On the helmet, run two hands-on mods and one harmonic siphon mod. On the arms, run one heavy-handed mod and two impact induction mods. On the chest piece, simply run whichever resistance mods you prefer for the content you'll be running. On the legs, run one absolution mod, one innervation mod, and one recuperation mod. On the mark, run one bomber mod, one one-two finisher mod, and one reaper mod. To go in-depth about the armor mods, I'll start with the helmets mods. The two hands-on mods will grant you a significant amount of super energy upon getting a kill with your melee ability, which this build will be doing plenty of. If you're running a damaging grenade and you're throwing your grenade often, it is perfectly fine to swap one of the hands-on mods out in favor of an Ashes to Assets mod. Ashes to Assets will increase the amount of super energy gained from grenade kills, which isn't helpful if you're running the healing grenade, but is a nice boost if you choose to run a damaging grenade with this build. The Harmonic Siphon mod will summon an Orb of Power upon getting a multi-kill with any solar weapon, which will be advantageous for your super energy gains, armor charge, and both ability and health regeneration. Onto the Arms mods, firstly the Heavy Handed mod. Heavy Handed will summon an Orb of Power upon getting a kill with your Powered Melee ability, which, again, will be happening constantly with this build. The two Impact Induction mods together will grant you 25% of your grenade's energy instantly upon dealing any melee damage, whether that be powered or unpowered, on a hidden 7 second cooldown. If you want, you can forego one of the Impact Induction mods for either a Harmonic Loader or Dexterity mod, which will lower Impact Induction's granted energy from 25% to 20%. It's not much of a sacrifice to be made, and can help your weapon's overall DPS immensely. In fact, in the gameplay you're seeing in the background, I was only running one Impact Induction mod. As I was running the Two-Tailed Fox Rocket Launcher, I selected the Authorized Void Weapons mod on the Seasonal Artifact and was running a Void Loader to increase its reload speed and thus my damage output during damage phase. As for the chest pieces mods, this one is entirely personal preference, and should change depending on the activity you'll be entering. For example, the gameplay in the background is the final boss room in the Spire of the Watcher dungeon. As there is a significant amount of void damage, I was running two void damage resistances along with the Concussive Dampener to help protect myself from receiving too much melee damage. Unfortunately, as of right now, Elemental Damage Resistance mods don't have any extra effect if three are equipped instead of two, so don't run more than two of any one Elemental Damage Resistance mod. This is a known bug and has been written about in the TWABs under the Known Bugs section, which means it will likely be fixed at some point in the future. However, as of the uploading of this video, this is still in the game, so keep it in mind. Onto the Legs mods, Absolution will grant you 5% energy to all three of your abilities upon the collection of an Orb of Power. Admittedly, this isn't very important for this build. Effectively, the only thing Absolution is doing is granting you 5% grenade energy, as you'll always have your melee ability up and your barricade doesn't need to have the same uptime as it would with the Lower Lace Blender Helm. Thus, if you'd like, you can swap Absolution out for really any other mod you want. I tend to swap it out for a Scavenger if I feel I need more ammo for my weapons, and this was the case in the gameplay you're seeing in the background. Next, the Innervation mod will grant you 10% grenade energy every time you pick up an Orb of Power. With Heavy Handed, you'll be generating Orbs of Power constantly, which will be continuously granting you grenade energy via this Innervation mod. The Recuperation mod will grant you 70 health upon picking up an Orb of Power, which is actually more health than the Cure buff granted to you when picking up the Throwing Hammer after having to strike an enemy. Having Recuperation equipped will effectively heal you to full health upon killing an enemy with your Throwing Hammer, as collecting the Throwing Hammer and the Orb of Power generated will grant you a total of 130 health. This makes being in close proximity to multiple enemies at least twice as safe, which is invaluable, especially in solo and or high difficulty content. Lastly, for the Mark, the Bomber mod will grant you 12% grenade energy upon the use of your class ability. Admittedly, you won't see much use out of this mod, as your grenade's uptime will already be very high with the Absolution, Innervation, and Impact Induction mods, but Bomber will help you if you're not close enough to enemies to pick up Orbs of Power or to melee anything. Next, the 1-2 Finisher mod will allow you to instantly fully refund your Throwing Hammer should you lose it. So long as you have 3 stacks of Armor Charge, it will fully refund your melee ability upon performing a Finisher on any enemy. As this is the only mod that takes advantage of Armor Charge, and with this build's Orb of Power generating capabilities, you'll always have 3 stacks of Armor Charge if you lose your Throwing Hammer, meaning you'll always be able to use 1-2 Finisher to fully refund your Throwing Hammer. 
Lastly, for mods, the Reaper mod will cause your next weapon final blow upon deploying your class ability to summon an Orb of Power. Similarly to Bomber, this mod won't see too much use, but it will do well to increase the utility of your barricade and weapons, plus being a guaranteed Orb of Power if you or your teammates need one. With the armor build now done, I'll get into some weapon recommendations I have for this build. Before I start, however, one weapon perk that synergizes best with this build is Incandescent. Incandescent will cause any enemy killed to explode, scorching any enemies nearby. This perk is incredibly strong for any solar build, not just this one, so if I miss a weapon that you enjoy using and it has Incandescent on it, don't hesitate to use it. Almost every solar weapon released during and since the Season of the Haunted has had Incandescent as a rollable perk, so it's not hard to farm for one should you happen to not already have one. As heavy weapon choice can vary heavily depending on the activity you're doing, I'll refrain from recommending any specifically and instead use that time to mention a couple more energy weapons than I normally do. Firstly, my absolute favorite solo weapon in the game, the Callus Mini Tool Submachine Gun that was available during the Season of the Haunted. This weapon is unfortunately no longer acquirable, unless Banshee or Xur happen to be selling one during any particular week. However, Bungie has already detailed their plan for putting red borders onto weapons you already own, which could mean that they will bring back a way to get this weapon and its pattern next season. As for a role I recommend, as this weapon is craftable, the role I run has Threat Detector in its third column with Incandescent in its fourth column. Threat Detector will synergize heavily with this build, as you'll be in close proximity to multiple enemies very frequently, which will grant the weapon increased reload speed, stability, and handling. Incandescent, as I've said, will scorch any enemy nearby to one you kill, which is good for any solar build in general. Second, the BXR-55 Battler Pulse Rifle from the Dares of Eternity. This weapon is craftable, and its pattern can be acquired from completing Dares activities and using treasure keys at Xur's Treasure Hoard. As for roles I recommend, in its third column, Demolitionist and Perpetual Motion would be my top picks, with Killing Wind being a perk that could work in both PvE and PvP. In its fourth column, Incandescent is the perk to choose. But, if you don't have it crafted and are dealing with random perks, Blunt Execution Rounds would synergize specifically and especially well with any melee-oriented build, and Kill Clip is a decent option as well. My crafted BXR has Demolitionist and Incandescent on it. Third, the Amit AR-2 Auto Rifle, whose pattern can be acquired via the Foundry Resonance Quest at the Relic Conduit at the Enclave. This Auto Rifle is a good choice, and its pattern is super easy to acquire, making it a really easy go-to option if you don't have any other weapons mentioned in this video. For roles I recommend, in its third column, Ambitious Assassin and Stats for All will be your two best options. In its fourth column, Incandescent is the perk to choose, but if you want to try something else, One for All will pair really well with Stats for All in the third column. My crafted Amit AR2 has Ambitious Assassin and Incandescent on it, however I may swap that out to Stats for All now that auto rifles have gotten buffed. Fourth, the Strident Whistle Bow from the Vanguard Ops playlist. Strident Whistle is not craftable, but it is efficiently farmable, and is focusable at Zavala in the tower using Vanguard Engrams. This precision frame bow is a lot of fun to use, and as bows are one of the best PvE archetypes in the game at the moment, this is definitely a weapon to farm for, if not only for the fact that it's the only bow in the game that can roll incandescent at the moment. In its third column, perks I'd recommend hunting are Archer's Tempo, Perpetual Motion, and Killing Wind, which is a sleeper perk on bows in my opinion. In its fourth column, the main perk to hunt for is Incandescent, but alternatives that still make this bow feel good to use are Explosive Head and Successful Warm-Up. I haven't gotten the Archer's Tempo Incandescent roll I want, but I have gotten Perpetual Motion and Incandescent, which is also very good. Fifth, and penultimately, the trusty Scout Rifle, whose pattern is acquirable from the first encounter in the Deepstone Crypt Raid. This Rapid Fire Frame Scout Rifle is really fun to use and has an origin trait that has a very interesting synergy with the Incandescent perk. The origin trait on the Deepstone Crypt weapons is called Bray Inheritance, and with the trusty Scout Rifle, it will grant you 0.3% energy to all three of your abilities upon dealing damage. Importantly, Scorch Ticks caused by Incandescent will continuously proc the Bray Inheritance Origin trait and will grant you that ability energy constantly. As for perks I recommend on Trusty, in the third column, Rapid Hit, Perpetual Motion, and Killing Wind are all good perks. In the fourth column, Incandescent is definitely the top choice with its synergy with the Origin trait. Swashbuckler would also work with this build, but Incandescent is just the best choice. My crafted Trusty has Rapid Hit and Incandescent on it. Finally, the sixth weapon I recommend is the Acacia's Dejection Trace Rifle. This weapon and its pattern are acquirable from the second, third, and fourth encounters in the Root of Nightmares raid, and is both a really strong and really fun weapon to use. In its third column, perks I'd recommend are Rewind Rounds, Reconstruction, and Perpetual Motion. In its fourth column, Incandescent takes the top recommended spot, but other perks that would work well are Paracausal Affinity and Frenzy, with either Target Lock or Vorpal Weapon being perks that would be good for champ busting if Trace Rifles get a seasonal anti-champion mod. I've got a couple of rolls of this weapon, but my favorite by far is Rewind Rounds and Incandescent. For exotic weapons, there are a bunch that synergize with Solar 3.0 and apply Scorch in their own way. Exotic energy weapons that apply Scorch are the Jotun Fusion Rifle with its Catalyst, the Polaris Lance Scout Rifle, the Prometheus Lens Trace Rifle, the Skyburner's Oath Scout Rifle, and the Sunshot Hand Cannon. Exotic heavy weapons that apply Scorch are the 1000 Voices Fusion Rifle and the Two-Tailed Fox Rocket Launcher. With weapons now done, I'll quickly describe a playstyle that would suit this build. When entering an engagement, firstly look for any adds from whom you can summon sunspots for yourself, as well as build up stacks of Roaring Flames. 
Once you've gotten your 3 stacks of Roaring Flames, you can start to take out higher health, higher threat enemies, as you'll be dealing 73% extra damage to them, as well as already having Restoration continuously healing you. If you know you're about to start a boss damage phase, do your best to kill an enemy as close to the beginning of the phase as possible so as to keep Roaring Flames times 3 up if you plan to use your super, or to proc Radiant if you plan to use your weapons. But really, that's it for the playstyle. Keep refreshing your buffs by killing enemies with your throwing hammer, use your super if you know you'll need significantly more damage resistance or for certain boss phases, and enjoy effective invincibility. And that's all for the video, thanks for watching. I wanted to take a quick pause here to thank all of you for helping me reach 1000 subscribers. Thank you for all of the feedback on my previous videos, as well as all of the kind words, I'm incredibly thankful for everything you guys have said. If you enjoyed this video, have any comments or constructive criticisms, and would like to see more videos like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps more people see these videos, as well as helping me make more of them. If you'd like to join our clan, the Tyrant Seraphs, I've left a link to both the Bungie website and the Discord server in the description, so check those out if you want. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.